Have you ever wondered why or how Joseph and Hiram Smith ended up in Carthage jail and why the mob sought to take their lives? And have you ever found yourself in the middle of a gut-wrenching trial, having a difficult time understanding why you have to go through such a hard time when the future seems so unclear? Have you ever found yourself in that moment wishing the Lord would give you some clear instructions to help you endure or eventually find relief? Today's episode will answer these questions about the mission and martyrdom of the prophet Joseph Smith and also provide some potentially unexpected light from God that can help us get through the most challenging moments of our life. Hi everyone, welcome to the Hope in Christ podcast, a weekly conversation following the Come Follow Me curriculum of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, where we dive deeper into the scriptures and use them as a launching pad for relevant conversations to help us all live Christ's gospel, survive living in the last days, rediscover how we fit into God's plan, and increase our hope and faith in Jesus Christ as we work to prepare the world for His return. I'm so glad you're listening and sincerely hope you enjoy the show. Hello, my friends. It's so great to be back with you in another episode and another conversation about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know it's only been a couple of days since our last episode released, but I've been working for about a month now trying to get back up to date so that these episodes can be released at the beginning of the week so that they can be a supplement to your study throughout the week. Today's study is based in sections 135 and 36 of the Doctrine and Covenants, but as we begin this conversation, we have to fill in a little bit of a time gap. The first section that we'll study today announces the martyrdom of Joseph and Hiram Smith, but chronologically, the most recent revelation that we studied was section 132 that was revealed about 11 months prior to their martyrdom. So let's talk a little bit about what led up to Carthage Jail. Let's start with a man named William Law. William Law was a counselor in the First Presidency in Nauvoo, and he had committed adultery and kept it from Joseph and Hiram Smith. He felt extreme guilt for his sin, and about that same time, he was presented with a copy of the Revelation on marriage and plural marriage. William Law took issue with the idea of plural marriage, which possibly was influenced by the deep guilt that he was experiencing because of his own adultery, and he begged Joseph Smith to renounce the teaching. But Joseph Smith testified that the Lord had commanded him to teach the principle of plural marriage to the saints, and that he would be condemned if he disobeyed. As discussed earlier, in fact, it wasn't until Joseph Smith understood the consequence of condemnation that he finally consented to practice and teach the law of plural marriage. William Law became sick and eventually confessed his adultery to Hiram, and he asked Joseph if he could be sealed to his wife. Joseph inquired of the Lord and received revelation that William could not receive the sealing ordinance because he was adulterous. William Law became infuriated with Joseph, and he and his wife effectively left church attendance. But like so many other dissenters, William Law could not leave the church alone. He had become extremely embittered and wanted to crush the prophet Joseph Smith. He began to secretly plot with others in and outside the church who opposed the prophet and would eventually lose his membership in Christ's church. At the same time, feeling an urgency as a result of the opposition that was building in and around Nauvoo, Joseph's teachings about the temple ordinances became more of a focus in his sermons in the coming months. With the temple under construction but not yet near completion, the prophet officiated in temple ordinances for a few dozen church members. As tensions continued to escalate in Nauvoo, Joseph Smith sought friends in the national government of the United States who would befriend the saints and help them seek redress for the losses that they incurred in Missouri when they were ejected from their homes and their personal property. So Joseph had written to five of the candidates who were currently running for president of the United States, asking them if they would support the saints' efforts to recoup their losses in Missouri. He heard back from three of the candidates, which says something of the influence Joseph had in the nation at the time. But each of the three that responded to his letters acknowledged that it was more of a state issue and they didn't promise anything to Joseph. The saints numbered around 10,000 or so individuals at the time in and around Nauvoo, and their voting power as a collective group could have been an attractive benefit to any potential candidate. And with no help from the candidates, Joseph decided to run for president of the United States himself. 
On January 29, 1844, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles nominated Joseph as a candidate. William Phelps helped Joseph Smith draft a pamphlet that he could publicize across the nation. Joseph Smith's presidential platform, which was a bit unusual to have at that time, included giving the president more power to put down mobs, to liberate slaves by compensating their owners with the sale of some of the western territory lands, turning prisons into places of learning and reform, and expanding the nation westward but only with the consent of the Native Americans. It was important to Joseph Smith that on terms of religious freedom, he stood for people of good faith no matter what their denomination or religious beliefs. Joseph could sense at the time in Nauvoo similar strife that they experienced in Missouri, where dissenters from within the church, as well as opposers from without, were making threats and building opposition to God's prophet and the church. These threats, coming from both Missouri and Illinois, resulted in Joseph beginning to look west for a place where the saints could potentially go. With prophetic vision of the future, Joseph Smith wanted to build a place where the saints could establish the kingdom of God on earth and have laws that would govern the Lord's people into the millennium. Joseph considered places like California, Oregon, and Texas, all outside of the current borders of the United States. On March 10th, and 11th, 1844, Joseph Smith formed a new council of men that would oversee the establishment of the Lord's kingdom on the earth. The council is known as the Council of Fifty, and it included some individuals who were not members of the church. Joseph Smith respected individuals of good faith no matter their specific beliefs. Sensing that something was about to happen, even that he may be killed by his enemies, Joseph felt pressed upon to confer upon the twelve apostles all priesthood keys, so that he could rest knowing that the work of the Lord would be able to go forth. He then shared with them the sacred burden of leading the Lord's church. At the church's April 1844 General Conference, the final conference of the church that Joseph would attend, Joseph spoke openly about significant doctrines of the gospel and of the eternal nature of God's plan. It was there that he delivered what many now refer to as the King Follett Discourse, a doctrinal sermon named after a friend of Joseph's who had passed away shortly before the conference. In that sermon, Joseph taught the eternal truths that God is in the form of a man and that righteous men and women are to progress themselves from grace to grace through Jesus Christ to sit in glory in everlasting power, being like God. Now let's go back just a little bit and talk about a man named John C. Bennett. John C. Bennett was a man who had moved to Nauvoo and there joined the church. Though it's pretty clear that he saw his membership with the saints as an opportunity to rise in power with this growing group of religious followers, he had political influence and convinced Joseph that he could help the saints. He helped draft and obtain the Nauvoo City Charter and served as an assistant president in the first presidency of the church. His time in the church was short-lived, however. He was a repeated adulterer, and had been using the revelation on plural marriage, which he probably didn't even understand, as justification for his repeated immoral behavior. He lost his membership in the church, and turned violently against the prophet Joseph Smith, spreading rumors around the nation that Joseph was an adulterer, and that he was even involved in the attempt on the life of Governor Boggs in Missouri. John Bennett also tried to convince people that the saints were looking to take over the world. John Bennett had now joined up with William Law and others that were plotting the prophet's demise. William Law formed a new church and decided that in June they would publish the Nauvoo Expositor, a newspaper that was meant to slander the church and speak false accusations in guile about the Lord's anointed prophet. And as you're likely aware, that would not be the last newspaper that would seek to slander the church and paint it in a bad light. John Bennett and William Law also insisted that Joseph Smith strayed from the restored gospel by introducing the temple endowment ordinance, the practice of plural marriage, and the doctrine of eternal marriage and exaltation. For several days after the paper appeared in print, the Nauvoo City Council, overseen by Joseph Smith, met and decided that the newspaper would provoke some of the hostile locals 
to violence, and it was not safe that the paper should exist. Joseph Smith proposed declaring the newspaper a public nuisance and destroying the press that printed it which was an action that wasn't unheard of at that time. Of course, the Saints' press in Missouri was destroyed by locals who felt the same way about the threat of the Saints, and abolitionists who fought against slavery throughout the nation were attacked, and their presses were also burned and destroyed by groups who were defending slavery. John Taylor agreed with Joseph. John was the editor of the newspaper, Times and Seasons, that the church printed, and he believed in free press and free speech, but Joseph and John believed that they had a constitutional right to protect themselves against written and publicized false defamation. They knew destroying the presses would be controversial, but they felt the law allowed them to do it legally. Joseph even read from the Constitution of the state of Illinois about the freedom of press so everyone at the meeting could understand the law. And another read from the law book about legal justification for destroying a nuisance disturbing public peace. Feeling justified by the law, Joseph ordered the destruction of the press that printed the Nauvoo Expositor. Destroying that printing press caused riots and mobs who were ready to destroy the saints. On June 12th, Joseph was arrested with members of the city council, but they were released. Knowing that violence would eventually erupt, Joseph wrote to Governor Ford of Illinois, pleading for help against the mobs. Governor Ford saw that the saints acted in good faith but didn't feel they were justified in destroying the press, and he promised Joseph protection if they would stand trial. Knowing that perhaps the only way to protect their families and the rest of the saints would be to go to Carthage and stand trial, Joseph and Hiram determined to turn themselves to the courts, even though Joseph had known that if they go back to Carthage, they will be butchered regardless of Governor Ford's so-called promise of protection. Joseph and Hiram went to Carthage with a few others, and on June 25th, they posted bail there and were freed until a formal trial could be held for their charge of inciting a riot. But that evening, they were committed to Carthage jail on a false charge of treason. It's very interesting to note here that treason was the same charge that Jesus Christ was charged with when he appeared before Pilate. At first, the Sanhedrin met and charged the Savior with blasphemy, saying that he could tear down the temple and rebuild it in in three days, which would be blasphemy against their religious faith. But wanting the Savior dead, the Sanhedrin knew that they needed to come up with a charge that would cause Pilate to want to execute the Savior. And so they charged him with treason, claiming to be a king. Similarly with Joseph, the charge of inciting a riot was not enough to execute him. And so Joseph Smith, too, was charged on a false charge of treason against the government. While incarcerated in Carthage jail, Joseph expressed concern for their safety if they were left in Carthage unattended. Governor Ford promised Joseph that if he went to Nauvoo, he would take Joseph with him. The governor broke his promise and did not take Joseph and Hiram with him to Nauvoo. But before leaving for Nauvoo, Governor Ford placed the Carthage Greys in charge of guarding the jail. The Carthage Greys were the most visibly hostile group of militiamen in Carthage. That militia cooperated with the mobs that eventually murdered Joseph and Hiram in cold blood. As a tribute to Joseph Smith, we have section 135, that draws from the accounts of Willard Richards and John Taylor, who were present with them at their martyrdom. Because you have section 135 and can read it for yourself, I wondered what we might do in this episode to pay tribute to the prophet Joseph Smith. And as is the pattern of this podcast, I decided to pull from the teachings of our modern prophets. Recently, in a new mission leadership seminar, President Russell M. Nelson shared some inspiring words about the prophet Joseph Smith and his mission. He said, We marvel how Joseph was able to accomplish all that he did in his abbreviated lifetime. His amazing accomplishments were enabled by the miraculous and matchless power of Almighty God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and many other heavenly beings. His work was also facilitated and complemented by his dear wife Emma, Her constant capable support and her faith, which she demonstrated time and again, cannot be overemphasized. 
In addition to the first vision, we know of at least eight other occasions that Joseph saw the father or the son. Four of these visions included both the father and the son, while the Savior appeared another four times by himself. In addition to these transcendent experiences with the father and the son, between the first vision in 1820 and the prophet's death in 1844, Joseph was visited or saw in vision dozens of ancient prophets and angels. Joseph personally interacted with diverse angels from Adam down to the present time, all declaring their dispensation, their rights, their keys, their honors, their majesty and glory, and the power of their priesthood. Through these remarkable experiences, Joseph came to understand that worldly knowledge pales when compared to heavenly knowledge. On one occasion, he declared, Could you gaze into heaven five minutes, you would know more than you would by reading all that was ever written on the subject. The angel Moroni figured prominently in Joseph's early tutoring, making at least 20 visits to him in the 1820s. At the time of Moroni's first visit, Joseph was only 17 years old, just a little younger than the youngest of our missionaries. Now let us consider the role of Joseph Smith as the revelator of our Latter-day Scriptures. Much of our precious body of Scripture was revealed through the prophet Joseph Smith. Through him, we have received more pages of Scripture than we have from any other prophet. The Book of Mormon is tangible and irrefutable evidence of Joseph Smith's foreordained designation as the prophet of this dispensation. It is another testament of Jesus Christ. It teaches more about the Savior and His infinite atonement than any other book. It is the instrument that heaven has placed in our hands to help us gather Israel. President John Taylor taught that Joseph Smith was acquainted with such men, for instance, as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Adam, Seth, Enoch, and Jesus and the Father, and the apostles that lived on this continent as well as those who lived on the Asian continent. Other sources confirm that Joseph was tutored by Old Testament prophets, all the New Testament apostles, including Paul, and Book of Mormon prophets, including Nephi, Alma, Mormon, and the twelve Nephite disciples. Likewise, Joseph and others saw numerous unnamed angels during the Kirtland Temple dedication and in the following week as part of the promised endowment with power from on high. Many of these experiences are not captured in the scriptures but various accounts indicate that Joseph Smith saw in vision or was visited by approximately 60 angels during his lifetime. Each came as directed by the Lord for various purposes. As you know, John the Baptist and Peter, James, and John restored the keys of the priesthood authority. Others, such as Moses, Elias, and Elijah, also bestowed priesthood keys. This is God's work, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Joseph Smith is the prophet of this last dispensation. That's the end of the quote from President Nelson. My friends, two years before his death, the prophet Joseph Smith wrote that he'd received many visits from the angels of God, unfolding the majesty and glory of the events that should transpire in the last days. We have the Lord's promise and that of his prophets, that as we engage ourselves in his work, we have the same promise of angels who will surround us and protect us, prompt us, inspire us, and go with us as we do his work. At the time of the martyrdom, Brigham Young was in Boston with Wilford Woodruff. They had heard rumors that Joseph was dead, and they finally received written notification from the late Kimball in Nauvoo, confirming Joseph and Hiram's death. The news just shocked them. Brigham was lying on the bed in the home of a member in Boston and cried for hours and hours. He said, we've got to get to Nauvoo. He was at the train station in Boston, and Wilford Woodruff was sitting next to him. He had his chair up against the wall, just kind of daydreaming, thinking, wow, what are we going to do? Then, like a bolt of lightning, it hit him. Wilford Woodruff recounted that Brigham came down and put his hands on him and said, The keys are with us. We've got them. From that moment on, Brigham Young understood that the keys of succession had been given to them by the prophet Joseph Smith and rested with the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. As we now bridge into section 136 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the saints finished the Nauvoo Temple and raced to endow as many of them as they could with the endowment and power from on high before they left Nauvoo. Because of heavy persecution that continued, 
Beginning in about February of 1846, Brigham Young began to lead groups of saints out of Nauvoo and across the Iowa Territory to a place they called Winter Quarters. As the saints traveled to Winter Quarters, they had to trek across a plain that had turned into a muddy quagmire. They lived in Winter Quarters in wagons, caves, and some in quickly built hovels or cabins. They were exposed to the elements. They had no food or very little food to nourish their bodies and suffered from scurvy and other diseases. And by the time the saints left the Missouri River Valley, there were hundreds upon hundreds of them dying. The Mormon battalion at the same time had taken 500 of the most capable saints to help fight for a just cause on behalf of a nation, the United States of America, a nation that had essentially exiled them with no protection of their rights or liberty. The saints, as they left Nauvoo, received offers for their property that were about 6% of their value. The nation simply wanted the saints to leave, and yet the saints were still willing to give and to fight for that nation. There was a lot of doubt among the saints at this time, wondering where they were all going wondering why they were going through so much suffering, why so many were having to lose their lives, and why Brigham had not given clear direction on where they were to go. Despite the fact that they were following the example and direction of the living prophets and apostles, these saints were facing extreme challenges. If we can see section 136 within this historical context, the verses of this section can become for us what they were to those saints 175 years ago, an inspired roadmap to chart the waters of unprecedented adversity, challenge, and uncertainty of the future. As you complete your own personal or family study of section 136, try looking at it in that light. In section 136, look and listen for the inspired direction that will guide you across the uncharted plains of your mortal journey. To get you started, here are a few highlights from this section that I found. When the Lord is leading us through unknown territory, and when the end is difficult to see from the beginning, remember that you are not alone. In this revelation to the saints, Brigham Young emphasizes that we are in this together. What a difference that can make when you know you're not alone on this journey and that you're not alone in feeling the effects of agonizing and gut-wrenching challenges. To know that others may be experiencing more difficult trials than you are can be a humbling experience, especially when you're in the depths of your own agony. As the Savior taught us by His own example and reached out in love to others that were in need, while He Himself was in the midst of His own moments of agony, so can we find great peace in our trials when we seek to lift and serve others who suffer. Stay on the covenant path. Keep your eyes riveted on the ordinances of the priesthood and their associated covenants, and on Jesus Christ, who is the center of the symbolism in those priesthood ordinances. There is significant peace and heavenly power in focusing our lives on Jesus Christ and on our covenants with Him. Prepare yourself. Make sure your life is in order. When I was a missionary, I had companionship inventory with my missionary companion every week. Perhaps you did the same. It was a chance for us to set personal goals and to be accountable for those goals with each other and help each other improve. I find it so helpful to have that type of personal inventory on a weekly basis even now. It really helps me keep my priorities aligned and helps me correct my frequent deviations from the path I know I really want to be on. When I can set my goals, analyze how I'm doing on each one, and communicate them with my wife and let her know so that I can be held accountable so she knows and I know that she knows what my goals are. So I know she knows when I'm not doing them and when I'm falling through. Another highlight from this section as we go through hard times is to not be afraid. Remember that as long as we're putting trust in the Lord, He's driving the wagons on the trek of our life. And though our trials may take us right up to our breaking point, the Lord will not allow our trials to break us. Instead of becoming a broken person through our trials, 
The Lord hopes that through humility and meekness, and with His help, we can instead receive a broken heart that we can then offer up as our personal offering to Him in exchange for sanctification and a share of His holiness. The Lord promises us in this section that as we pass through these hard times, when the future is so unknown, and perhaps heaven seems to be silent to answer our prayers and our pleadings, if we will humble ourselves in the way that we call upon Him, He promises that our eyes may be opened, that we can see His hand, and promises that our ears can be opened, so we can hear Him speak peace and reason to our hearts and minds. We may still not know all of the answers, but we will know enough to keep both feet on the covenant path, moving in love and compassion for others as we build and increase our hope in Christ and approximate ourselves to Him through our fierce loyalty and our faithfulness to His name. The Lord tells us, cease to contend with one another. Cease to speak evil of one another. Wow, when you're going through a hard time, it can be so easy to find fault and complain about everything, even about anything. The things that relate to your trial, the things that don't relate to your trial. This advice couldn't come at a better time when it seems that everyone has something to gripe and moan and complain about, and they all seem to go to social media to vent it. Cease to contend with one another. Cease to speak evil with one another. The Lord tells us that He will be our Savior, that He will save us. He says, I know it's hard. I know it's painful. But I'm going to save you. When we're going through hard times in life, it can really help to not worry so much about where the Lord is taking us, but about where our heart is on that journey and who we are becoming. The Lord has a way of taking us down roads that can test and try us to our core. Don't be so worried about where He's leading you along your journey through mortality. Have trust in Him and in His power to save and exalt you and teach and tutor you along the way. And concern yourself with the condition of your heart and your level of commitment, your fierce loyalty and consecration to Him and to His church. Trials are so much easier when we lose ourselves in service to His children and in His church. Our prophet, as we go through this life, may not know every event that will transpire and the exact timeline for each of them, but he receives direction from the Lord to guide us away from the pitfalls that lie in our journey, and he knows well the voice of the Lord and how to teach us to hear and follow him. Those were some of the highlights that I found in this section to help me get through my hard times. This revelation in section 136 brought the saints a ray of sunshine in a world and period of bleak darkness. It reaffirmed to them that despite the continued trials and suffering and even the death of the prophet Joseph Smith, they were still the church of Jesus Christ. They were still his covenant people. And this section can remind us the same thing. Well, friends, I've enjoyed chatting with you in this episode, and I look forward to next week's podcast episode where we get to wrap up the final two sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. Good luck in your own personal study, and God bless you until next time. Thanks for listening in today and for taking the time to subscribe and share this message with people you love. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. You can also find this podcast on YouTube at Hope in Christ, a Come Follow Me podcast. Or connect with me on Instagram at Bro Ben Peterson. And remember until our next conversation, there is always hope in Christ.